Welcome, and thank you for joining today's conference, HCV Dashboard Demonstration. Before we begin, please ensure that you've opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. You can submit questions throughout the presentation to all panelists from the drop-down menu on the chat panel. Enter your question in the message box provided and send. All audio lines have been muted until the Q&A portion of the call. We will give you instruction on how to ask a question at that time. With that, I'll turn the call over to Stephen Durham, Director of the HCV Program. Please go ahead. Hey, hey thank you, Janelle. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us today on the the HCV Data Dashboard World Tour. Uh, we've been doing demos uh, almost daily now for the last uh, couple of days uh, as we uh, embark upon a new phase of the dashboard. Uh, many of you guys are familiar with the dashboard already as it was uh, first developed and uh, debuted last March. Um, and in that dashboard, we focused on the HCV program more from the macro level we looked at it um, from national trends and, and also at the state level. Um, but with this new dashboard, new and improved da dashboard, the 2.0 version, um, what, we're, what we're doing here is we're uh, giving the ability to drill down to a more granular level, giving guys uh, the ability to see uh, the data at the uh, not only the national and the state level, but also a PHA uh, level filter um, with this dashboard. So what we're hoping that this is is a, a – a move towards uh, transparency within the program. We look at it as really a transformative tool uh, to allow our PHAs and, and our partners, uh, stakeholders like you guys, um, to have a, a better lens into what's really going on with the program, and then more specifically, what's going on with individual PHAs. And then how you have the ability, um, you'll see it with, during the demonstration here, uh, how to compare a PHA to another PHA, maybe that's like in size or maybe within the same region. Um, so the dashboard is is growing. It's dynamic. Uh, we think it's a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, the, the program support division within the voucher office has uh, taken this task on and has, has continued to build upon uh, what was already available, but using this tool, to, like I said, to improve and, and uh and to highlight the performance of the program. And a lot of the, the feedback that we received from the previous release um, has been incorporated into release 2.0, so we appreciate uh, the comments and we invite the comments to continue on, um, suggestions for uh, thing, uh, additional uh, data, things that may be uh, improvements in some eyes, things that may be more uh, informative to the general public or to the PHA. Um, so we're always uh, inviting opportunities for uh, information and for dialogue as it relates to the to the dashboard. Um, so, you know, before we jump into the demo, I just want to let everybody know we do have a mailbox now that is set up for the dashboard. That is hcvdashboard at hud.gov. Um, you'll see that throughout the presentation. And, and in that email in, uh, inbox, we'll be able to uh, take, take questions, respond to questions, uh, take suggestions as well. And then we invite you guys to, uh, to, to deliver and interact through that mailbox as it relates to, uh, to the dashboard and, and what you guys see today. Uh, so uh, what we have done is we've also included uh, MTW agencies. Uh, it, we have links to the two-year tool in there. We've improved those tools as well. We focused on things that we've previously seen, like utilization and reserve balances, attrition rates. But now we're, we're, we're adding things, program admissions and uh, per unit cost trends, uh, uh, visibility into uh, project-based portfolios at, at the local PHA. Um, and then one of the bigger things that you'll see is uh, leasing potential. Um, that's something that uh, we have focused on this year as uh, the PIH's important goal, wildly important goal for the year is to reduce the leasing potential on the program, meaning trying to house more families. And within the dashboard, you will see um, there is a screen that allows you to, to drill down and just look at individual PHA leasing potentials. Uh, so we also have a, a, a feature as it relates to special purpose vouchers. And so, you know, like I said, this is really a move towards full transparency as it relates to the program. We're very proud of it. Um, we hope that you guys enjoy it. We hope that you provide feedback. We're going to take questions at the end at the end of the presentation. There's a lot of information. Um, so, you know, please take it in. Please provide any feedback. We really appreciate it. 
And once again, thank you for joining us today. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Marika Bertram from the PSD division so that she can give you guys a, a great demonstration of what the tool is available uh, and the dashboard is available for you guys to see. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and I'll turn it over to Marika to Hello, everybody. My name is Marika Bertram. I'm a program analyst in the Program Support Division within the Housing Choice Voucher Program, and I'm excited to be here today to be talking to you about the Housing Choice Voucher Dashboard 2.0. Um, so first off, I'm going to go to with how you can access this dashboard. So um, the same HUD.gov website still exists that housed our initial Housing Choice Voucher Dashboard, but has been updated to be able to indicate this new dashboard as well. So. What you're going to see is that you can always see the embedded um, voucher dashboard within here, but if you want to have it in a bigger, um, for, you know, a, a, a more visible way, you'd click on this link and you can easily bookmark that link to be able to reference this voucher dashboard at any given time in the future. It also includes a new and updated um, user guide and data dictionary, which goes through how we calculate the various aspects of this dashboard. Um, in this data dictionary, and we have a voucher um, tutorial video on how to use the voucher dashboard. Um, all of this has been updated for our newest release of this voucher dashboard, and we also have linked here how you can contact us at that HCV dashboard at HUD.gov that Stephen mentioned. So as um, Stephen mentioned, we're really excited about this dashboard, and we are um, excited to be here today to talk to you about it. So whenever you enter the voucher dashboard, um, the first thing you're going to notice is it talks about where the data is coming from, from our various HUD administrative systems, such as HUD caps, the voucher management system, and PIC. Um, it also gives you the vintage of the data. So for example, right now, this data showcases January of 2021. We're about to move on to February 2021, um, and we should have that shortly. Um, You'll notice that usually the data is about two months delayed, and that's very much due to the, two, the 60 days that we provide PHAs to report into the voucher management system. Um, and therefore, this is as much um, up-to-date information as we ourselves have at the voucher um, program level. So we're sharing it with you within days of being able to actually at, um, see this information ourselves. Um, this also includes moving to work agencies. So our previous version of the voucher dashboard did not include moving to work agencies. It actually excluded them. Um, this new version does include them and allows you to turn them on and off in a filter capacity. Um, to be able to identify and go through the different pages of the dashboard, you're going to use these arrows down here on the bottom. So going to the very first page, you're going to see a summary. And this is all part of what was 1.0 um, previously, but the newest additions are the fact that we have these additional drill downs. So whenever you get to a new page, it's going to showcase the information at a national vantage point um, and also give you the vintage of the data, so January 2021. Um, so this information here is going to show you a lot of the overview of the voucher program itself. So what is the year-to-date HAP expenditures versus year-to-date budget authority? What's that overarching budget utilization year-to-date? What's the total amount of HUD reserves that we have seen as of the end of the calendar year that has gone through a full reconciliation process? What is our average per unit cost? Year-to-date leasing percentage? as well as this all-important leasing potential number that we're going to get into in more depth. We also showcase this uh, budget utilization trend chart here. Um, so this leasing potential number was included in our voucher um, dashboard 1.0, but we didn't get into a lot of details, and we didn't allow you to dive in further than a state level. Um, now we're going to be able to allow you to dive in all the way down to a public housing authority level to see leasing potential. Um, leasing potential, we felt that showcasing it here is really important to help move forward our wildly important goal, which is one of our internal um, goals this year, to reduce leasing potential all the way down from 95,000 here to 45,000. So that's housing 50,000 additional families over the next over this current calendar year. And so we think that shining this light on this is going to help um, hopefully move the, the needle and allow us to increase our utilization of the voucher program. 
So the way that this works is similarly to how we had it work in the past, you have these drill down menus that allow you to interact with the data. So for example, if you wanted to look at the state of California, you simply click that drop down menu and then all of the information will then cascade from that. So um, rather than looking through 2000 plus public housing authorities, um, you would be able to simply see the, the PHAs that are associated with the given state that you've selected. So if you wanted to look at the city of Los Angeles, you'd be able to quickly and easily see the information here about their half expenditures, uh, total reserve balances, your, uh, per unit cost, leasing potential, and the trends that they've seen within their budget and unit utilization over time. Um, similarly, if you wanted to only look at um, MTW housing authorities, you could use this to be able to identify that you wanna look at MTWs and this list would get even bifurcated down further so that you would just see those that are MTW housing authorities. So clearing the filters here, I'm gonna go on to the next page. Um, this page really focuses all about budget and reserve information. So again, this was part of the initial release of our dashboard, but does now include our MTWs. Um, so what you're gonna see here is you're gonna have a lot of information around our budget authority, as well as total amount of reserves, and then also our reserves as a percentage of budget authority. So what you're gonna see is that how much of that budget authority um, is so how much of that reserves is as a percentage of budget authority. So for example, if we wanna look at non-MTW housing authorities, and we wanna see who has the highest level of, levels of reserves and peer reserve numbers, you'd be able to see that here, as well as what is that reserves as a percentage of their budget authority. And we do put in a caveat here that says that we recommend that each PHA have a certain level of reserve so 4% for PHAs that are on the larger side with um, over 500 units, 6% for PHAs that are in the mid-range between 250 to 499 units, and 12% for PHAs under 250 units. So we definitely do expect folks to have a certain amount of reserves, but some folks do, some PHAs are holding a higher level of reserves. And what you'll normally see is that that um, equates to uh, somewhat of a higher leasing potential. And so that's something that you'll see throughout this um, dashboard. Now, for example, if I wanted to go back to the state of California, all of this information would adjust for the state of California, and you would be able to see who's holding the most level of reserves. A lot of these folks are the MTW agencies up at the top as they have more fungibility um, with their funds, um, as well as you'd be able to see see the budget utilization year over year and the half assistance, half payments compared to budget authority for each month over the last seven years. Um, going to the next page, one of the things to be aware of is that whatever your selection is, it's gonna continue throughout the dashboard. So since I selected California here, you're now going to see California selected throughout the dashboard. So as you do this interaction with the dashboard, um, where, whatever you're interested in, whether it be a specific state or a specific housing authority or like overarching MTWs, et cetera, that selection that you've made on the initial pages will flow throughout until you clear your filters. Um, so for example, looking at the state of California and we wanna look at the leasing page, we can see that the um, leasing percentage or the leasing utilization in California used to be quite high back in 2014 compared to the national average, it was about 90, percent. Um, but over the last um, several years, we've seen that that leasing utilization has declined and is now more mirroring that national average. Um, similarly, you can also see a lot of information for the state of California for other types of information on this page. So you can see that the monthly number of vouchers on the street was definitely um, higher on average in the 2019 period. And then with the pandemic really started to dip down. We saw a lot of public housing authorities reduce the number of vouchers that they had on the street during um, the initial stages of the pandemic. And that's now rebounding, which you can see here. Similarly, we also have information around our average per unit cost. And a lot of this variability here is due to the um, MTW housing authorities as their half expenses for given month may be on the, uh, may have spiked. Um, so if you actually smooth out the MTWs here, 
um, you'll see that that um, trend really starts to get a little bit smoother here. And you can look at what the overall non-MTW average per unit cost has looked like over the last several years. Um, you can also look and see what the attrition rate is. So the attrition rate for California PHAs is about 4.88% um, annualized, and that is actually um, definitely lower than the national rate. So if you wanted to compare that to the national rate, you could clear your filters and see quickly that California has a, has a lower attrition rate than the national average, um, which we would expect given their how, given the crisis of housing affordability in California, so less people are leaving the program. Going on to the next page is really where we have we start to see some new additions to the dashboard. So this page is brand new. It's part of the 2.0 release. Um, it, it's focused mainly all around leasing changes and what are the causes of those. Um, so on the right-hand side of your screen, you're going to be able to see which PHAs have had the largest reductions in units leased as a percentage of their overall UMLs since the last year. So, and you can also see who's had the largest increases. Now, anytime you see these types of buttons here, it allows you to interact and actually change the visual and be able to see different information. So if you want to see who's had the largest increases, in units leased, you'd be able to click on this button versus reductions over here. So, for example, if we we're interested in Lake Charles, which obviously had a um, huge disaster this past year, and we want to see how they're recovering and how that has affected their unit um, units that have been leased, we can actually click on this, and all of the information within the entire dashboard will adjust on this page to be able to focus on Lake Charles. So, for example, in the Housing Authority of Lake Charles here, if you wanted to understand more about their new admissions trends, you can see that they had some new, they've had new admissions such as this in, their, in the PIC system. You can also check out their end of participation actions um, as well as their attrition rate. So you can see that the attrition rate was um, increasing there. And then they're, really the interesting part is their vouchers on the street. So for vouchers on the street, you can see that in the past several months, they've been putting out tons and tons of vouchers to help make up for this um, decline in leasing. And so I think that's of a lot of interest to folks. Um, so going back out of uh, that specific selection of Lake Charles, what this does on a national level is it does provide you a good information about what are we seeing as new admission trends, both homeless and non-homeless, over the last year as well as where are we seeing, you know, end of participation actions? Are those two things so equivalent that it's almost a zero-sum game for the specific PHA, or are they putting out a new, enough new admissions to counteract their EOP actions? We also look at the annualized attrition rate that we're seeing within the PIC system, and we showcase the UMAs and UMLs. So you can see how the program has been growing nationwide um, with our unit months available and our unit months lease and how that has actually affected the overarching leasing utilization. Um, and all of this information is able to be drilled down to the state and PHA level. So for example, if you wanted to specifically look at the state of California, and you wanted to check out new admissions and how the homeless admissions are looking, you'd be able to simply and easily look at that or select on a given housing authority if that's what you're focused on. So going to the next page, this is also focused on California, as that was my selection on the previous slide. Um, and what this is looking at is per unit cost. So it gives you at a glance what the average per unit cost for the current month is, as well as what does that look like over the last several years. You can see that per unit costs have been skyrocketing in the state of California, and you can say, see which PHAs have actually had the highest increases in per unit cost over the last five-year period. Similarly, there's only one PHA actually in the state of California that's had a reduction in per unit cost. And so you can see that one right here. So for example, if I wanted to look at the County of Marin, um, you can see that their PUC, or the per unit cost, has increased from about $1,100 to over $1,900 in the last um, several years. And so that's a huge per unit cost, 59% over that five-year period. Um, 
And you can also see what those average per unit costs look like year over year here. So getting into the next sheet, um, what you're going to be able to see here is a lot of information about our special purpose vouchers. Um, this also is part of our initial dashboard rollout. But what we do think is really interesting here is being able to, at a quick and easy glance, See what the, which PHAs have your special purpose vouchers within a given state, as well as being able to select a specific um, PHA and find out which special purpose vouchers they have. So, for example, if I had selected the state of Arkansas and the city of Fort Smith, I can easily see that the city of Fort Smith Public Housing Authority has um, two special purpose voucher types. They have the mainstream program and the veteran supportive housing program or HUD BASH. And you can easily see that uh, utilization of those special purpose vouchers at a glance. So backing back out of this and going to the next sheet, um, we focus on what is the percentage of their HCD program that is special purpose vouchers. This is the newer sheet or newer report and really it showcases how and which PHAs have a large percentage of their voucher programs being these special purpose voucher types. So this includes both mainstream family unification program, the non-elderly disabled program, and our BASH program. And you can see that nationwide we have about 9% of the total HCV programs are um, special purpose vouchers. Now, when you dive into that, say you want to look at Arkansas again, they, you can see quickly and easily that they have a smaller percentage of their HCV program is special purpose vouchers. It's only 5.69% versus the national average of about 9% there. And for any given public housing authority, you'd be able to quickly and easily see what is the percentage of their overarching portfolio that is special purpose vouchers. And then getting to the brand new pages, um, all of the rest of this um, report is all brand, um, brand new. And so I know a lot of interest is going to be around our leasing potential. So as we mentioned previously, leasing potential is um, one of PIH's wildly important goals for this year. We're planning to increase leasing utilization and thus to decrease leasing potential. So leasing potential is at 95,000 right now, and we're trying to get that down to 45,000 or house 50,000 additional families. Um, so at a glance, this page not only provides you a quick summary of what leasing potential is and how it's calculated, um, but does provide you a lot of information around leasing potential, not only what it is at a glance currently, but what the trend has been around leasing potential and who are the folks which PHAs have the largest amount of leasing potential in peer units, as well as leasing potential percentage as a percentage of their portfolio. So, for example, if you wanted to understand which PHAs had a large number of peer units of leasing potential, you could look at this top chart, which showcases that, you know, Michigan State Housing Development Authority, the City of Los Angeles, Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee, these PHAs have a lot of leasing potential in peer units. You can also see which PHAs have a large percentage of their portfolio is actually leasing potential. So some folks may have a very small program, but they still have as a percentage of their portfolio a large amount of leasing percent potential. Those folks would not be on our hot list. We have an internal hot list that identifies which PHAs have over 75 units of leasing potential and 2% of, of their portfolio is leasing potential. These smaller guys would not come to the top of that list, but do, it does showcase that this is a large percentage of their portfolio. So this allows you quickly and easily to be able to identify what the leasing potential looks like in your area. So if you wanted to say, look, look at the state of Arizona, you can quickly and easily see what the overarching trend of leasing potential has been in that state, as well as who are the folks who have the highest amount of leasing potential in that given um, state. Or you can go all the way down to just selecting, you know, the state, city of Phoenix and seeing, um, for example, for the city of Phoenix Housing Authority, what is their leasing potential trend look like? Looks like how many families could we potentially be serving, so 217 additional families at this current time, um, and just see that that information is portrayed in that filter right there. Um, 
as folks I'm sure have more questions about leasing potential, we do indicate here that we ha are happy to answer those questions at our HCD dashboard at hud.gov email address, as well as we are currently in the midst of writing a very detailed description of leasing potential, which will have an example of how it's calculated, and we plan to post that here on our HCV at HCV HCV data dashboard page at HUD.gov. And so be on the lookout for that as well. That's currently in our clearance process, and so we do plan to post that. So hopefully it'll be um, even more substantive on how that is calculated. Um, going into the next couple pages, we really focus at a level around project-based vouchers. So project-based vouchers were part of we're not focused on within the dashboard previously, but it has become a larger percentage of our HCV program over the past several years, and so we felt that it was important for us to share information about the project-based voucher portfolio externally. Um, what you can see here is back, back in 2015, um, there was only about 1% of our HCV portfolio was project-based vouchers, but that's now 10.6% of our portfolio now. So you can see that it's definitely growing over time and therefore is of more importance um, in sharing that type of information and having that transparency. So what this page showcases um, is it gives you the number of RAD units leased, our PDV units leased, and how many PDV units we have coming online and are currently under an agreement for HAP contract or AHAP. We also give, a, um, give an overview of what the PDV leasing has looked like over time. And then you can use these buttons to interact with this. So you can see how many PDV units or project-based vouchers are leased versus unleased over time. And look at what is the overview of the project-based voucher type. So which programs have been growing and creating that increase in our project-based voucher portfolio? So you can see that non-RAD PDVs tend to be a large percentage of it, but there is a lot of RAD 1 and RAD 2 units coming online. And again, all of this information you can dive down, and for example, if you wanted to look at the state of Colorado, you can easily select that state or that public housing authority and see what types of pH, what types of um, PDV units they have and be able to examine what their uh, PBV unit utilization is and other metrics like that. So the next sheet gives a lot of information around our project-based voucher portfolio and how which PHAs have a large percentage of their portfolio being project-based vouchers. So right at the top here, you're going to see that the total number of PHAs that have project-based vouchers, including those that are under AHAP. So we have 756 PHAs that actually have project-based vouchers or agreements to enter a HAP contract for PDD. We have 744 that actually have project-based vouchers that are already under HAP, and we have 742 that have project-based vouchers under HAP that are already leased. So you can see that there's two PHAs that haven't even leased any of the project-based vouchers that they have under HAP right now, and we have 12 that are only having a HAP agreement. Also, what you can see is you can see that there's 1,400 PHAs that don't have any project-based vouchers at all in their portfolio. But we do have 40 PHAs that actually have 50% or more of their portfolio is made up of project-based vouchers. And what this table here shows is for any PHA, and you can select on these given types, what is the breakout um, of their project-based voucher portfolio? Is the how and how much of their HCV portfolio is project-based vouchers. So for example, this, pro, you know, this uh, specific PHA here for Troy Housing Authority, 70.74% of their housing choice voucher program is project-based vouchers. And you can see that that is made up of both RAD1 and non-RAD PBB units. So, and all of that information is always drill downable. So you could, for example, look at the state of Louisiana and see which PHAs have what percentage of their portfolio is project-based. So there's 15 PHAs that have project-based um, vouchers in their portfolios there. And then the last two sheets of the report really are things that you've seen before 
or, but are allowing a new way of examining it. So this allows you to do comparisons side by side. So all of these metrics are metrics that you've seen in previous parts of this dashboard, but allows you to do this side by side comparison. So for example, if you wanna compare a state um, to say Arizona, um, and you can wanna compare that to the national numbers, you'll see here that the state of Arizona has shown up on the left-hand side of your screen, while you have the national figures here on your right. Um, that selection for that um, specific comparison will allow you to see budget and reserve information on this page, and then allow you on the next page be able to examine per unit cost and leasing information for your selected comparison. So if you wanted to compare a state to the national numbers, you'd be able to easily do that. Or you could also drill down to say, I wanna look at the city of Glendale and be able to compare that to the national numbers. So for example, here, if you were looking at this, city of Glendale is holding about 7.97% of their um, budget authority and reserve. That's less than the national average. Um, they have a, you can see their trend analysis here. And when you're examining the leasing versus per unit cost information, you can see that they have um, only two vouchers on the street currently. They have about a 10% attrition rate. So they have a higher attrition rate than the national average. And you can see that they have a similar trend of per unit cost and that it's going, it's definitely been increasing over time, which we've seen nationwide. Um, and you can see that they have a higher leasing percentage than, uh, the, than the national averages. Now, another way to do this would be to do two different like size PHAs side by side. Um, so for example purposes, I like to look at the same size of PHA. So you can use this drop down menu here where you can identify if you wanna look at just very large housing authorities. And then if you wanted to look at two different um, PHAs from the same state, say Florida, and you wanna look at say Tampa and Miami side by side. So on the left hand side of your screen, you're gonna see Miami-Dade and on the right hand, you're gonna see Tampa. Um, so two like-sized housing authorities, similar, similar state, obviously different markets and that Miami-Dade is different than Tampa, but something that you might wanna do a comparison analysis for. And so this would allow you to do those comparisons side by side quickly and easily, rather than having to drill back and forth on the earlier pages. And so what you'll immediately see here is that the Miami-Dade Housing Authority has a higher percentage of their um, budget authority is in reserves, 7.43%, um, which is higher than that 4% that we tend to recommend on average, while Tampa is closer to that HUD recommended level of 4%. The other thing you're gonna see is that the unit and budget utilization trends are very different for the two over time. Um, and then you can also examine what their leasing and unit, leasing and per unit cost uh, trends have looked like side by side. So immediately what you'd see here is that the Miami-Dade Housing Authority has a much lower attrition rate than the Tampa Housing Authority. And that is definitely a, a part of, you know, the different housing market that is in Miami-Dade. It probably has less affordability, so less people are leaving the program. You can also see at a glance that the Miami-Dade Housing Authority has a higher leasing utilization, not by much, but definitely still, still um, higher than the Tampa Housing Authority. You can also easily see the two per unit cost um, trends side by side. So up until the time of uh, the pandemic, Really, there had been such, there had been a lot of variability in the per unit cost in Tampa, but really it hadn't increased significantly. It was still only hovering into 2019 at a bit over $700, despite having had many years of variability. We only really saw a lot of increases in the per unit cost in Tampa once the pandemic hit. And so we, we've seen that nationwide where the per unit cost has just been skyrocketing during the pandemic and has then seen some stabilization um, as folks are either being um, gaining back uh, employment or also including the unearned income as part of their per unit cost uh, calculations. Um, so that's something that we can see here that they've had really not a ton of increase in per unit cost until recently in Tampa. 
that's very unlike the picture that we see in Miami-Dade. Um, obviously here we've gone from about under $800 to at the height of their uh, increases in per unit cost, it was up to $1,150. And so that's a huge amount of increase in per unit cost over the last several years. And it's only recently started to stabilize in the Miami-Dade market. So what this is allowing you to do is really be able to do these side-by-side -side comparisons that wasn't, uh, wasn't um, able for us to make that easy for folks before, except for, you know, taking screenshots or doing drill downs and then switching your filters back and forth. This allows you to do it in a much easier and quicker manner. And then finally, we close this out with, um, you know, identifying that obviously anytime you look at this information, we encourage you to check out the and do the projections. So obviously this is showcasing a lot of information that shows previous trends. What is our current state? What's our current per unit cost? What does the per unit cost trend look like? What does our leasing utilization look like? But when you're trying to project forward, um, this dashboard is not the right tool to be using. It's really to go utilize our two-year tool and other utilization tools. So we encourage folks to check those out. All of those are linked here. And we always say that, you know, if you have any ideas for improvement or um, questions about the dashboard, please contact us at HCV dashboard at HUD.gov. Um, so with that, I think uh, we can open it up for questions. Did the operator give the instructions to uh, folks on the phone on how to? I think I mean, so they were going to go. Yeah, if the event producer can re repeat how to ask questions, you can also always use the chat feature. Okay, maybe maybe we lost the uh, the uh, event producer uh, to those on the phone. So if you do have questions, uh, we can still see them in the chat feature. Um, so we ask you if you could type them in. And, and we have one here, Marika, it says, can data from the dashboard be downloaded into a spreadsheet? So unfortunately, currently, the way that Microsoft has the permission set up, when we publish this um, on a public-facing web page, it does not allow for downloads. Our internally-facing one does. Um, so if you have um, interest in downloading specific information, you know, email us at hcvdata dashboard at hud.gov and we can um, work with our appropriate, um, like our, with the appropriate folks to make sure that we're providing um, the data that is, you know, FOIA compliant and whatnot, but anything that's in here would be very easy for us to extract. And once that capability is approved by Microsoft, we will roll that out. Okay, great. Next question we have here is, can you explain the decision to include homeless admissions on the new admissions page? So including the homeless, oh, sorry, including the homeless admissions was one of the actual asks from some of the, some of our internal folks. And since we were building that out internally, we thought it was of help um, externally as well. And we think it's interesting, especially if, Oh, sorry? Oh, no, go, go ahead, Marie. Any, sorry, this is Danielle. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I think, you know, especially for folks that are, have a huge homeless problem, it's interesting, um, you know, for advocacy groups and other folks to be able to see if we're housing folks that do fit that homeless description and are being identified as homeless during time of admission on their 5058. And this really came about um, during the Obama administration um, with the push to end homelessness. And, you know, it's, it's not required. Um, PHAs, a lot of PHAs did continue to enter that data and check that box. Um, but just because they're checking that homeless at admission box, we do not assume that the definition of homelessness that they're using ticks and ties to, you know, McKinney-Vento or the Heart Act definition. Um, oftentimes the PHAs use their own particular definition of homelessness. So I would say that's a caveat on that, on that field. 
Okay. Um, would you explain the goal of the 50,000 reduction in leasing potential? And so I'll, I'll take that one. I, that's uh, the uh, PIH's fiscal year goal. It's our wildly important goal. I'm sure you guys have heard that numerous times. Um, and the estimation at the beginning of the year was that there was approximately 95,000 units of leasing potential available throughout the program at large. Um, and so the goal was to reduce that by at least 50,000. That was a goal that we thought was achievable um, given the amount of uh, attention that we're going to place on this year. Um, so our, our partners in OFO are working with PHAs that have been identified that have um, large amounts of leasing potential to come up with leasing plans and outreach efforts to hope, hopefully um, help us achieve the goal of re uh, housing more families on the program. Stephen, do you know if anyone from OFO is on the line as a panelist and wants to speak to this? Mandy was on. I don't know if Mandy is still on. Mandy, are you still available? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, do you, you want to tell me? them what, what? Yes, we can, Mandy. Sure. Um, so, the the goal, um, is, as Stephen had said, is to try to get as much of the uh, funding out as possible to serve as many families as possible to either help more families or help families more over this year. Um, that number is an estimate and it's based on a number of factors that um, I think Marika may have mentioned the development of the guidance document that's going to go along with leasing potential. Um, we understand that it fluctuates based on what things uh, like costs of the local market fluctuate, um, but it's a target for us to, to try to help our housing authorities use as much of the funding as possible, which not only benefits the families, but benefits the housing authorities because it increases their administrative revenue. Um, and it helps them deal with local market uh, fluctuations and gives them opportunities to right-size their payment standards to small area FMRs. There are a number of things that um, we're bringing out to the housing authorities to try to help them customize their approach to leasing. So our plan and our goal is to get to the end of this year with what would be a, a safe level of reserve for the housing authorities, but not to have funds um, sitting aside that could be used to serve families. I don't know if that answered the question sufficiently. Let me know if there's anything else I can add to that. That was fine. Um, appreciate that, uh, Mandy. Um, the next question we have here, uh, Marika, is will this information be updated monthly? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we will be updating it each time we have uh, new data. And so I would actually expect the February report to roll out within the next week or so. And then, yes, monthly after that. Okay. Great. Um, here's another one. This is a data one, and uh, Marika can answer it, or, or uh, we may ask Marianne to jump in here for, um, from the uh, MTW group. And it's, uh, why, would you explain why MTW agencies resulted in spikes in the PUC data? Sure. So the PUC data is um, each time it's calculated by taking that month uh, that month's HAP cost, so our housing assistance payment cost that's in the uh, that's in the voucher management system over their unit month lease. So for an MTW that can use HAP for other fungible purposes, it may look like it's quite high for one month when it's actually not only being utilized just for housing assistance payments, and so that provides for that spike in. Um, the variability for per unit cost. And so a lot of times we tend to look at non-MTWs when looking at like overarching national trends. And that's why we initially, when we initially rolled out the dashboard, it was just non-MTW. Um, but we had a lot of interest in including the MTWs, um, hence the expansion. And Marianne, do you have anything else to add? No, thanks, but you, you nailed it. Thank you. Great. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Marika, can you, uh, can the dashboard be embedded in other non-HUD websites? 
That I actually don't know. I wouldn't, I don't know why somebody couldn't take this link and embed it, especially as like a hyperlink anywhere else. Um, but I have not made any other non-HUD websites. So uh, feel free to reach out to HCB dashboard at HUD.gov and if you have interest in doing that, I can try to play around with you with it. So, but I don't know the answer for sure off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, next question is, um, can you explain possible reasons for, for example, uh, Lake Charles attrition rising by close to 30%? Um, and I'll ask Mandy if Mandy has, uh, being an OFO, kind of our boots on the ground, can you speak to that? Sure, I'd be happy to. So when we look at um, these variables in the program. Um, I don't, Marika, are you able to pull Lake Charles back up again? Yeah, absolutely. Hold That'd on one second. Great. One of the things that we try to uh, focus in on are what could be some reporting anomalies. Um, so from time to time, we'll see a large spikes or dips in data. And because this, these charts and tables are generated mostly by information that's being reported by the PHAs into VMS. This could be a, a place for us to start looking at whether or not PHAs understand the specifics uh, of what needs to be reported. So um, in this case, for Lake Charles, you've got an annualized attrition trend. Um, so looking at the percentage over, you know, month over month, in this, um, in the fall of 2020, it looks like thing, it, it jumped, almost doubled um, the number of people leaving the program. Well, what we also know is that in the fall of last year, a number of the states were rolling out some additional housing assistance programs. So one of the things that could have been contributing to this is people having resources that they didn't have access to before for housing, and they may actually have left it for another program. Um, other issues, depending on the size of the program, I like Charles's 1,100 um, vouchers, so it's, it's a larger program. It's not going to be as affected by um, 10 or 12 people moving around, but they could have had um, different uh, housing options come online within the agency, and they might have been able to move people. For example, um, they could have been doing a repositioning effort and families could have moved back into a project, um, oh, of course, I'm getting a message here. Um, there was a hurricane. <laughs> There's a great example right. of things that happened. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, don't, um, not living on the Gulf Coast, I, those kinds of things do escape my mind, but sure, natural disaster, big issue there. Um, yeah, and, but over and, and dovetailing on, sorry, Mandy, I was gonna say dovetailing on that, all of this is a trailing, so it's annualized. So this number of 131, 2020 is actually, you know, 12 months ending 131, 2020. So this is all, these months are actually starting to include that disaster, while these previous months were including months prior to that uh, disaster, hence this huge spike in the annualized um, attrition numbers. So it's always including that 12 month lag for an annualized uh, trend. Okay, great. Thank you, both Mandy and, and Marika. Uh, the next uh, question is a little bit of a statement and a question and I'll take it and it says, uh, why is there no additional context given for MTW agencies and why their reserve amounts may look different because they have fungibility? The public will not be uh, as knowledgeable about the nuances of the program, so HUD should be uh, given that additional context. And I, I, we do agree with you there. Um, I think we struggled with the notion of putting MTW in there for that very reason. Um, so we, as we wrestled back and forth with it, we decided that we would go ahead and put it in there. But that's the type of feedback that we're looking for from these types of uh, demos and conversations as to, uh, you know, what may be uh, information that could potentially be misleading or needs to be further clarified. So what we'll do is we will work with the MTW office to um, add some type of descriptive narrative. I, I would, yeah, exactly. And I, and I think it's like, so we also have, a, we, we understand, as Stephen said, right, that this, uh, some of this stuff is very complicated and nuanced. 
Um, it's part of the rollout campaign. We also have a data dictionary that's on the front page that hopefully provides a bit more context and a video. Um, we're also doing individual presentations for all the different PHAs, right? So they're aware if they get public questions, uh, it's been emailed out to them, as well as for the MTW PHAs, right? The uh, MTW plans are available on the HUD website, right? So there's some of that uh, extra nuance, particularly around the MTW PHAs, hopefully, is available on the HUD website. Obviously, it's hard to uh, explain it in all the charts and graphs here, but we, I think there's other ways where hopefully the public can be informed and, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, to be clear, is it currently, are those um, caveats currently in the data dictionary now? We do. We don't, we don't go into the in-depth of uh, all of the fungibility of the MTW program, right? But they, we do explain much of the fields. And if there is feedback on, you know, how we could further uh, expound on any of the fields, we can easily update it. And yeah, we do link to the MTW website to explain, you know, how that, how the MTW program works. But I think that there is some area that we can expound upon a little bit more and include another uh, disclaimer that we can add in short order um, with this rollout. So, so yeah, that's a, you know, so that's something that we will continue to, to work on. As, as Chad mentioned, we have resources that try to explain the dashboard um, in, a great, in greater detail that people have the ability to, to dive into. We do have disclaimers available, and uh, like I said, we'll try to get something from the MTW office that's fairly short and concise and possibly that we can put on the page that gives a little bit more context of why they'll look different without, you know, overwhelming the page there. Um, Let's see. All right. The next question uh, are why are reserves included in the calculation of percentage of budget authority utilized and available? So I, I think what they're Mike. referring to uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but what I think that they're referring to is why do we show uh like reserves in this budget utilization piece as well as reserves as a percentage of budget authority. Um, and hopefully that, that, is the answer, that, that is the question. So reserves as a percentage of budget authority is showcasing that total amount of reserves as, like, as a numerator over the total amount that we see in budget authority for that program. Um, so that is how much we're actually kind of keeping safe of your budget authority in reserves. This utilization figure that includes reserves is to showcase, like, so we have budget utilization here, which does not include the reserves. But if folks are interested in understanding, once you included all of your reserve balance, what would your budget utilization look like? So especially for folks that are, that are using over 100% of their budget authority, People may ask, well, why are you doing that? Well, you might have a large percentage of reserves. So once you can see that they have what their utilization is inclusive of reserves, um, it can kind of give you a sense that they're trying to help spend down some of their money because they did have that larger percentage of reserves. I think that that was where they were going with that one, but I might be incorrect. Well, uh, we'll definitely appreciate you. Uh, you know, trying to trying to answer it with the with, given the, the tech issues here. Um, the last question that that we have, and there's quite a few more here in the chat feature. So what we'll do is we'll uh, get the transcript from uh, the event producer if, if we ever get that person back, and then we will try to uh, answer, give you guys some written answers to some of these questions that you uh, have posed here. But the last question is, and I'll give this off to uh, Mike Larisha, is would you repeat your hot list? Criteria. How does a PHA get on the hot list? So it's both a absolute number of uh, units that are leasing potential, and as a percentage. So, and it's just this is basically for HUD in allocating our resources towards PHAs. Our our effort was if you could only work with X number of PHAs, which ones would you uh, work with to get the highest impact? Uh, and so the what we used was 75 units, and I think it was 2% of the program. So obviously, you wouldn't work with NYCHA with 98,000 units if they had 
100 units of leasing potential um, with that tiny percentage, but you would look at PHAs who met some threshold of it being a share of their program and in absolute numbers, you know, added up to something uh, that nationally was meaningful. And when we use that criteria, we normally get to about 75% of the leasing potential among 150 to 250 PHAs. Okay. Okay, uh, so we're up here on time here, and one of the questions is, is more general, so I'll just give a quick answer on that. And the, uh, the question is, the dashboard is a substantial improvement, including MTW was really helpful. Are there any plans to, to have something similar for public housing? And not just for public housing thunder, but they are working on a dashboard um, that will be uh, serve the purposes of the public housing program um, that is in development. And I don't know the specific timeline for when they are going to roll out uh, for public consumption, but I know that they are um, working feverishly and should have a product uh, fairly soon that they'll probably be engaging in these types of demonstrations with you guys so that they can get the feedback and make sure that their tool is uh, helpful to, uh, to the industry at large as well. Um, hey, Steve, but we, I can yeah. um, answer the question of when. Uh, so oh. we gave a little preview last week to the Four Corners when we talked about the voucher dashboard. Um, and so they're hoping to have a rollout by the end of this fiscal year. Um, but we could certainly see, um, if you're interested, if we wanted to do just a preview to get some feedback on kind of what we've done so far. Um, I think it's going to be really great. It's really detailed. It can even go down to the AMP level. Um, and it's just a really interesting parallel right now. So if you are interested, it's definitely not as far along, but I think maybe getting your feedback early on would be a good idea. So we could definitely set something up for that as well. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, we are at 4 o'clock, and so we do appreciate all uh, the interest, the questions. Um, as we mentioned before, we do have the uh, the mailbox for the dashboard, HCV dashboard at hud.gov, and we would um, welcome your questions, uh, suggestions at that mailbox, and we will uh, do our best to answer them. Um, despite the tech issues we have in here, like I said, we'll try to get the, the transcripts for these questions that you have in the um, the chat feature here, and then we'll prepare some answers and we'll have them circulate. I know you guys all participate in uh, the Thursday afternoon call with Dominique, so we'll try to have something, maybe if it's not for this Thursday, uh, for next Thursday, something that we can uh, hand out or give you guys uh, to answer some of the questions that we didn't get to today. So thank you again for joining and appreciate all the feedback. It's, uh, it's appreciated. So have a nice day. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.